I thought I would turn attention to what I think is the most interesting part of my job, which is doing field research. And in doing so, I'll give you some sort of concrete examples of some places that I've gone my research, particularly in Solomon Islands and Timor-Leste, and then also now in Chile. And in, within that discussion, I'll illustrate some sort of general themes in transitional justice and some ways in which it's worked and not worked. And hopefully it'll give at least some insight into kind of what this field is all about. So, in terms of a little bit of background, I know the term transitional justice is a little bit jargony, and I'll shorthand it to TJ from time to time. It gets a little bit cumbersome. Basically, what it means is it's the study of how countries and individuals deal with the consequences of widespread violence, including human rights abuses, human rights violations, that are perpetrated during either periods of authoritarian rule or leadership, or in periods of armed conflict, including civil wars. And as the name would imply, this study is basically about what happens after a transition is made from an authoritarian regime to democracy or from a period of conflict to a period of relative peace. And although there's a lot that's still unknown about sort of how transitional justice actually works or like the, the realistic impacts or effects of these processes, the field is actually still reasonably new. I can at least provide some insight into some kind of theoretical ideas or theoretical groupings of some of the potential benefits of transitional justice or, or why it's sort of important. And the first is these kind of systems, these transitional justice strategies uh, can be used to facilitate this transition from an authoritarian regime to a democracy and also from conflict to peace. And one of the mechanisms that's commonly used to facilitate that transition is the institution of amnesties, which are basically official or institutional pardons or protection from prosecution for those people who have committed crimes in the past. And the next possible benefit is that these processes have the potential to either institute or reinstitute the rule of law. And in doing so, potentially ensure the non-repetition of abuses, of things that were done in the past. And two common mechanisms that are used to facilitate this are purging or lustration of officials who were associated with the past regime from their posts. This happens commonly with police forces or political leaders. And then also prosecutions, which are a little bit more straightforward, but they can happen on either the international or domestic level. And this is basically sanctioning or punishing individuals for crimes that were committed in the past. And then the last two are a bit more restorative, restoratively focused and turn their attention a bit more towards the community or individual level. And the first one of those is reconciliation, which is basically mending relationships between previously rival parties, and including trust building and that sort of thing. Basically facilitating their ability to live together again after a period of conflict. And a common mechanism that's used to facilitate reconciliation uh, is a mechanism called a truth commission, which is what I've studied kind of basically for the majority of my research. And the, I think the clearest way to describe what a truth commission is, is that it's set up like a trial in the sense that there's witnesses providing testimony, but the outcome isn't for punishment, but instead to create an historical narrative of the past, to document what happened in the past, and also to give victims an opportunity to tell their story and to have a voice in the process. And in some cases, these are also linked to reparation processes, which turns into the fourth sort of thematic topic of restoration and healing. And these reparations processes that are also considered to be able to facilitate this restoration and healing on the sort of individual or community level are basically symbolic or monetary forms of recognition to support the, yeah, basically to recognize the suffering of victims or victims' families during periods of mass violence. And I was introduced to this topic of TJ at the end of my bachelor's degree. 
in conjunction with taking some human rights courses and peace studies courses. And I basically immediately fell in love with it because it's super complex and has all of these different political and cultural and psychological components all happening within an international context. And this discovery or sort of this introduction to TJ uh, basically set the trajectory for what I do now, 10 years later. And after doing my master's degree, I did my PhD in New Zealand, where I had the first opportunity to conduct field research, which is what I will talk more about in just a second. And at this stage, I have done field research in five different countries, and including now Chile. So when I'm talking about field research or going into the field, Basically, this is going to a country or setting where a phenomenon or a process that a researcher is interested in is taking place. And the purpose of it is basically to search for evidence on the ground to help a researcher answer a research question. And the benefit of doing this kind of research over a sort of more global quantitative study or sort of a desk study, as we call it, is that one is able to gain insight from lived experiences and expert opinions from people who have close, intimate knowledge of things that have happened in the past, or in the present, it could be. Some of the common methods that are used in this field research process are interviews, which I've relied on most heavily in my research, and focus groups, as well as surveys and participant observation. And in talking about the process of field research, it's also important to comment a bit or sort of lift up the issue of research ethics, which we think a lot about in the social sciences. And basically, the most important principle is this ethic of do no harm. So as researchers, we don't want to arrive to a setting and somehow leave it worse than it was before we arrived. And this is particularly important when dealing with sensitive issues, which is not uncommon in the field research process. So we basically don't want to subject individuals to any kind of discomfort or to expose them to any sort of potential political or social repercussions for participating in our research project. And some ways to kind of limit those risks are to use anonymity, so basically to hide the names of people that are participating in your project when you go to actually publish your research. And then also something that I've done a lot in my research is to focus on asking forward-looking questions. So basically asking individuals about, in my, in my experience, their participation specifically in a TJ mechanism and then life afterwards instead of asking about past trauma or past abuse sustained, for example. So as a first example, my first foray into the field research world was during my PhD when I went to Solomon Islands and Timor-Leste. And I was interested in inquiring or asking about what is the impact of public truth-telling within these truth commission processes that I mentioned a minute ago on victims of armed violence. And through the 19 interviews that I did across those two settings, I found both some positive and some negative things that resulted after victim participation. And on the positive side, this experience of truth-telling led to some feelings of catharsis or relief, or one could call it a sort of victim healing, as well as acknowledgement, being recognized by their peers and sort of by the society as having gone through a traumatic time, as well as empowerment, particularly in, related, in relation to having the opportunity to contribute to the narrative about their country's past and have it be officially recognized in a Truth Commission report, for example. However, on the negative side, a number of people that I spoke with uh, had anticipated that some benefit would result from their participation. For instance, reparations or social assistance or assistance with some kind of a community project, for example, and were extremely frustrated and disappointed when they didn't end up receiving this. And another issue that came up a number of times was that some victims told stories about experiencing sexual violence in this public truth commission process. And when they returned to their community afterwards, they were stigmatized and marginalized because those kind of stories are very taboo in both of those cultures to disclose publicly. And this also points to an issue of sort of cultural incompatibility of some of these truth commission processes that don't adequately consider the culture and cultural norms of the place in which they're created. 
And now I turn to a few words on my current research in Chile, which is still ongoing. So I don't have anything very concrete in terms of findings yet, but I thought I would offer some sort of initial reflections and just a super, super brief background about what kind of TJ has happened in Chile. And Chile is a super emblematic case in the TJ world, and it's super well studied, and it's sort of in the very beginning period of when transitional justice started to be to be studied as a field. And up until today, from 1990, Chile has instituted actually almost all of the main transitional justice mechanisms, except for the lustration or purging of former officials, including two different truth commissions, various iterations of reparations programs, memorialization, for instance, the Museum of Memory and uh, Via Grimaldi, and also amnesty, as well as human rights prosecutions. And it's the last mechanism that I've been sort of the most interested in focusing on within my research. And I was basically interested in exploring the impact or effects of human rights trials at the sort of individual level, particularly on sort of trust building and, and feelings of security. And I had aimed to speak with people from both the victim and military side, but unfortunately had quite a difficulty to contact the latter side or to sort of access the latter side. So unfortunately, I only have sort of one part of the story. But at the individual level, at least on the victim side, and this could be a bit obvious, but it appears that there's sort of continually low levels of intergroup trust so the trials don't seem to have any sort of effect, like kind of the achievement and securing of justice hasn't seemed to have any particular effect on that. And then even though I've been looking at the individual level, inevitably some sort of themes and insights have come up on the state and societal level as well. And it seems that my overall kind of feeling about this is that the trials haven't seemed to have any particular, or I would say little or no impact on political reconciliation. And I've been, I've been pretty struck by how, although a lot of time has passed since the transition to democracy, um, there's still not really a unified narrative of what happened in the past. And the topic continues to be quite divisive and polarizing. And I've also come across a number of cases where there's still a lot of silence around the issue, even within families. So that's been quite, a, quite an interesting thing. But as I said, this is still ongoing. So we'll see where it ends up in the end. And with that, I will myself wrap up. Here's my email address if anyone has any comments or what have you. And thank you very much for your time.